Good morning. I'm so glad you're with us today. We are in, have just started a very important series called Wicked Whispers because every day we all hear the lies of the devil in our ear. The devil uses our own voice to just whisper things to us that um, we know aren't true, but sometimes they slip in and they get into our hearts and we start to believe them about ourselves and they grow into real insecurities about who we are and our future and our situations. How many of you would agree with me that you hear those lies uh, frequently? Just show of hands so we know we're not alone. We all get them. We all get them. Uh, and so last week we started this and uh, I kind of showed the difference between when the devil uh, gets a foothold and a stronghold. He's, he can't get in unless we let him in. And he's just looking for a little crack in the armor to slip through and get into our spirit, get into our heart and mind. Um, and the word in the Bible for foothold, the Greek word is topos, which is where we get topography. It just means a place. The devil's just looking for a, to get a place inside of your thought life, inside of your heart. And so that's why the Bible says things like, don't let uh, the sun go down on your anger or the devil will get a foothold. In other words, as the fiery darts are thrown at us, as people hurt us and offend us, we have to respond so quickly and immediately with forgiveness and mercy and grace because just anger, for example, if we let that simmer in our hearts, it just grows and grows and grows. And then the devil's got a place. And once we get him a place, he goes to work. And then it becomes a stronghold. And the word stronghold actually means a fortified castle. It means a military base. And so if we give the devil just a little place, he starts building a castle. And then, then we have full-blown insecurity in our hearts. We have believed the lie and he now owns us and rules us, and it is something that becomes a part of our identity. And so if you really struggle with deep insecurities or depression or anger or fear, or if you give yourself to any of the lies, it will move from foothold to stronghold. And so all it takes is just opening that door a little bit. I shared the example, our missions pastor, Emily Hall, said when she was uh, young, her siblings would chase her around the house, and she would try to run to a room and slam the door before they ever got in. But she knew if her big brother ever got that foot in the door frame, she couldn't close the door, and it was over. Then he'd just slide a knee in, and then an arm in, and then a shoulder, and then before you know it, the enemy's in the room, and he's coming to take over. And so once, once we let the devil in, it, it, it's, it's over. He's going, he, he's going to take over. And so that's why when, a, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, the devil just came looking for a little wicked whisper. Now, Eve, is that, is that really what God said? Would, would you really die? And at that moment, she should have responded with truth. And said, yes, that is what God says. Now get thee behind me, Satan. But she didn't. She entertained. She said, come on in, devil. Let's talk about this. Now, here's what I think. I don't, I don't know about. And that's when we give the devil a place. When we start engaging that conversation. When the devil whispers to you, let me tell you who you really are. Your future is hopeless. You really aren't that special. You're not significant in this. He's going to go to one or two extremes. He's either going to seduce you to make you think you're better than you really are, or he's going to try to stomp you to make you think you are less than what you really are. He'll just go with whatever works. Think of it financially. He'll either seduce you with greed and riches, or he'll scare you with the fear of poverty. And so with your value as a person, he's either going to seduce you, to puff you up and say, oh, you're, you're better than those people. No one's as good as you. Or he'll just try to stomp you down and say, you are worthless. You're never going to amount to anything. And so we have to walk the straight and narrow 
the center of God's word because everything the devil throws at you is a lie. This is the verse that really everything is based on out of John uh, chapter 8 in the Bible uh, where Jesus was having an interaction with the Pharisees and they were debating him and they were like, look, you know, our father is Abraham. And he's like, well, not really. If he was your father, you'd believe me. But you're trying to kill me. So your dad is actually the devil. And this is what he said about the devil in John chapter 8. He said, the devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So everything that comes in, you, we must become experts to distinguish, is this the devil or is this God? Or is this just bad pizza I had for lunch? We got to figure out. We got to be experts to know. Well, we always know it's the devil because he speaks words of hopelessness. He'll add that tagline. Things will never change. You're always going to be like this. You'll never, you've gone too far. You'll never uh, be loved by God. You'll always be lonely. It, the, the voice of the enemy, the voice of the devil leaves us anxious, fearful, worried, frightened, unsettled. The voice of God brings peace and it brings hope. It brings life. It brings faith. And the fruit of his spirit is love and joy and peace, patience, gentleness, and kindness. So we must really become experts to know when it is a lie from the enemy and when it is the truth of God. And when it is a lie, our response should be immediate and firm. Take those thoughts captive and not allow them uh, to have a space in our heart or in our minds so that it doesn't turn into a stronghold. Now, I want to give you two things that I think are critical. We're talking this morning very, very briefly about shutting the door on those lies. How can we avoid the devil getting that foot inside, getting a little space inside our heart and mind? I believe two things are critical, and number one is that we are fairly illiterate, illiterate as a uh, a church in America when it comes to knowing the truth of God's word, of really knowing how to recognize when something is a lie or the truth, because we really don't know, um, know his word well enough. In fact, I hear church people misquoting the Bible frequently. I'll just give you one example. I'll, I'll, um, at funerals a lot, as people are trying to minister to someone who is grieving, they'll say things like, now, you know, God will never give you more than you can handle. Or you know what the Bible says, God will never uh, let you encounter more than you can bear. That's not in the Bible. And so we've got to be careful because that sends the message of, okay, God knows you can handle this, so man up. And that's not, the only verse even close to that is a passage where God is, the, God is letting us know that he will never allow us to enter into a situation where we have no choice but to sin. He says he'll never allow us to face temptation that is the only way out is sin. God says he'll always provide a way out. It has nothing to do with God's, and I hear professional athletes quote this all the time, everybody, God's never going to give you more than you the truth is, I believe this world is way more than we can bear. You're going to walk through valleys that is way more than your heart can handle. Grief to lose someone you love is way more than you can manage. That is why we need the grace and mercy and love and forgiveness of God. We need him because this is more than we can bear. And so we must be careful. Uh, we must uh, study uh, to show ourselves approved and rightly divide the word of truth because it is life or death when we come face to face with these lies of the devil, how we respond to them. And, and his word teaches us that if we will abide in the truth, if we will allow the truth to live inside, abide means like abode, a home. If we allow the truth to live inside, side of us and we live in it, then we are free from the lies. This is how Jesus put it in John's same conversation with the Pharisees right there. He says, if you abide in my word, you are, that's 
when you're truly my disciple. That is when you are learning to live the life I'm calling you to live. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. One of the most concerning things about our culture today, I hear this all the time. You hear people say, well, you just need to live your truth. You just speak your truth. What? How many truths are there? I just want, there's only one way, one truth. One, Jesus, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We are either in the truth and the truth is in us, or we are outside of the grace and protection and will of God. But there's only one way. This is why we must commit ourselves to knowing him, learning to hear his voice when his spirit talks, and to give a foundation of his word in our hearts so that we can be free from all of these footholds and strongholds in our life. It reminds me of the, the book of Pilgrim's Progress, really popular um, book that uh, the main character is Christian. And he gives such a vivid picture of the Christian walk and the enemies we face and the battles we face. And in one scene in particular, you've got Christian who is called uh, to the place where uh, he is being led to go, but he enters into a path and all of a sudden he sees lions, roaring lions on both sides of the path that just are fierce. They're hungry. You can tell they want to eat him, and he's ready to turn back and says, I, I do not want to walk this path. But fortunately, there was a guide along the way that says, listen, you can't see the chains, but I'm telling you, they're chained up. They can't quite reach the path. If you will stay on the path, they can't hurt you. And in our life, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking to see who he can devour. And the moment you stray from the truth, the moment you leave the straight and narrow, he's got you. He's got a foothold and then a stronghold. If we will stay in line with the truth, those lions can't touch us. And so we must know how to fight this battle. How do we do that? Well, in Corinthians, this is what it says. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish these strongholds in your life. So your enemy is not that person at school or at work that just makes you feel horrible about yourself. Your enemy is not your spouse, although some days you're pretty convinced they are. Your enemy is not... That insecurity inside of you, it's not that opportunity you missed. It's you have an enemy that is waging war against you, that hates you and wants to destroy your life, and every day is bombarding you with lies about yourself and about your future. We must be in an offensive posture here to fight back. Otherwise, it is like going to war and pretending the enemy doesn't exist. And so if you grew up in church, here's a little trivia. In the book of Ephesians, it ends by saying basically the same thing as that passage where it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Therefore, we must put on the armor of God so that we may stand firm. And then it says, very first thing you got to do is to put on what is it? Who knows? That's why you're here. That's why you're here. First piece is the belt of truth. What's the belt do? Belt holds everything together. It holds everything on. Without the belt, things get real embarrassing real quick. The belt of truth, the truth of God is what holds all, the whole armor together, locks it in place. So to stand firm against the enemy, we must apply the belt of truth. You're going to walk down that path, and on every side of you is going to be lions ready to devour you. Well, how do you stay on the straight and narrow? The Bible says in the book of Psalm, his word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 
We must have the belt of truth to know what God's word says when those lies come against us. But unfortunately, we get kind of comfortable in our own insecurities and in our own troubles and problems. Some people got a problem unless they got a problem. They just love to be worried, love to be upset. Uh, one, one writer said, you know what the definition of worry is? Worriers are simply false prophets. Worriers proclaim the lies. For you to worry, it is to side with the enemy and to proclaim my life is not going to end up right. My life is going to come to ruin. So we must be true, speak truth into our own heart and lives. We sing that song, bless the Lord, O my soul. That scripture says, let us not forget the benefits of knowing God. One pastor said, you know what? That is really a proclamation to your own soul. Because when you don't see it and when you don't feel it, sometimes you got to rise up and say, all right, soul, it's time to bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Don't forget the benefits of walking with the Lord. And so there's two things that I'm going to ask you to commit to like never before. Number one is to be people of his word, people of his truth. Know how to recognize the lies and know how to come against them with the truth. Can you imagine Peter when he confronted Jesus and Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. What would that moment have been like? Jesus was sharp to discern when spirit. Peter was beginning to align himself with a lie and just immediate. That's, that's, that's not true. We're more like Eve. The devil comes at us. You know what? That's, a, that's an interesting thought. I, hmm. And so, number one, give yourself to the truth of God. And number two, I don't know if any of you have recognized this, but for me, sometimes it's easier for me to have faith for other people than it is for myself. Like, I can believe for your healing sometimes easier than I can believe for my own healing. I can believe God in your circumstance easier than I can in my circumstance. So here's the principle I want you to take home with you today. If you don't have faith in the truth, start by surrounding yourself with people who do. God has blessed you by putting you in a body of people with powerful faith, and sometimes it is critical to ask those people to come alongside us and to have faith on our behalf. And so Jesus himself would call his disciples around to pray. When the disciples doubted this Christian killer, Paul Barnabas rose up and said, listen, we got to give him a chance. He's the real deal. One interesting uh, story is uh, we were covered it last series when Moses went to encounter Pharaoh to demand that he let God's people go. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but God spoke to Moses and says, I want you to go stand before Pharaoh. This was the, the little G God on earth. He was the most powerful man there was, God says, Moses, I want you to go stand to him face to face and you tell him you let my people go or else. Moses like, you know, God, I, I kind of got a problem with that. And he had every excuse in the world as why it's really not a good idea for him to go to Pharaoh. He's like, God, listen, he's not going to believe me. I'm not even sure who to tell him to send me. I got, I got a speech impediment here. You hear me stuttering and shaking up. Like, it's, he's not going to understand me. God, let's talk about this. God's like, Moses. Throw your staff down, it becomes a snake. Put your hand in your cloak, it becomes leprous. And then God says, listen, I'm going to be with you. You're going to have that staff. And when you raise that staff, things going to happen, I promise. And Moses just so, in, he didn't have the faith to believe. So God said, I'll tell you what, take Aaron with you. Aaron was, okay, I'll do it. And if you look at their interaction with Pharaoh, they go to Pharaoh and says, um, now listen, God says you really need to let your people go. And, and Pharaoh says, I don't think so. And Moses was like, well, if you don't, something really bad's going to happen, and God's going to bring judgment. Talk to him here and do your thing. 
And it's really interesting. The first several plagues, it says Aaron raised his staff. Aaron raised his staff over the water and it turned to blood. The next time, Aaron raised his staff over the water and frogs came on land. Aaron raised his staff. He touched the earth and all of a sudden, uh, lice and gnats and flies. And then you just kind of get the sense that maybe Moses' faith is starting to rise up a little bit. He is seeing that what God said would happen is actually happened. And about halfway through the story, Moses is like, all right, Aaron, step aside. I got the staff this time. And it says, Moses began to raise his staff and to bring judgment upon Pharaoh. Moses raised his staff and the sky was darkened. Sometimes we need people around us to demonstrate the truth of God so that we can have the boldness and confidence to walk in it ourselves. Look around, you've got them. Because right now, I can have faith in your situation more than you, but you ha- might have more faith in my situation than me. And we need each other. And if you go at it alone and it's just you and the lies of the devil doing those wicked whispers, you might not make it through. One more story. I was really struck by after Pharaoh let God's people go, the final plague of death came, and Pharaoh said, get out, get out. And they began that journey through the desert, through the wilderness. And God had promised, I want to send you to a land where there will be plenty. It will be flowing with milk and honey. I'll wait. Everything you need will be, I want to send you. That's why it's called the promised land. God says, I'm promising you. I've got a good future ahead of you. I've got good gifts for you. There's something I want to give you. Just trust me. Follow me. And they had to cross the Red Sea and the seas parted. But then it took them 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, 40 years and out in the desert. And finally, after that time, they started to get a little close. And they could sense it and taste it. And it's in the distance. And Moses said, hey, yo, we might actually be getting there. So he says, Here's, I want to send 10 of you out to go scope it out. Tell me what you see. Send a report back. Go look. And when they came back, about eight of them, it's emotional for me because this just represents the things in our life that look impossible. And when they came back, they just fell down and cried. It's not going to happen. They said, Moses, Aaron, they've got giants. They've got soldiers. It's a fortified city. Look at us. We've been walking in the desert for 40 years. There's no way. They said we should have just stayed in Egypt. We should have just died there. And this is that moment where everything in you says it's impossible. And the voice of the enemy comes. There's no way. There's no way. Everything your eyes see says this is a hopeless situation. Every emotion you have is screaming at you that you'll never, never get there. All along, you know what God says. You know there's a place of healing. There's a place of hope. But I'm just going to tell you more often than not, for you to get to that place of healing, you're going to have to walk through some giants. You're going to have to walk through some valleys. You're going to have to battle the storms. 
God's going to grow your faith. He's going to test you. And everything, everything in you is going to say it's impossible. And this was how Moses and Aaron responded. He says, Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole everybody. And they were defeated. They just soak. We were so close. But there was a Joshua and a Caleb. Not all the ten. Two out of the ten weren't looking at the giants. Two out of the ten weren't looking at the walls, weren't looking at the weapons. Two of the ten were looking up to a holy God whose name is above all names and every enemy bows. Two of the ten, Joshua, son of Nun, Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire, see, you got to get the intensity of this moment. This is what it's going to take for you to walk through that valley, climb that mountain, defeat that giant. You got to have some kind of spiritual intensity to go to war with the devil. They tore their clothes and said, listen to me. Get off the ground. Don't you believe the lies of the devil? The story does not end here. The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Don't believe those lies. Don't give in to those wicked whispers. Do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Therefore, do not be afraid of them. The Lord is with you. You've got to rise up. And if all you've got is a thread of faith, then you cry out, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. My emotions are lying to me. My eyes deceive me. The enemy declares a false truth. The enemy is lying to me. The Lord has promised me something. He has promised that the future is good. And so when the the enemy comes at you and says, you are worthless, your life means nothing, you say, yeah, I know. And look at my life. It looks pretty bad. But I also believe that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I know that full well and that I am God's masterpiece created to walk in good works for him and that no weapon formed against me will prosper and that God has good plans for me, plans to give me a hope and a future. And he who began a good work in me will see it to completion. Devil, I will not believe the lie anymore. God's will will be done. And you just got to go to battle and you got to fight. And you got to cling to the truth of God like you never have before because sometimes that is all you've got. And don't let the enemy defeat you. Don't let him get a stronghold. Daniel, can we just sing that song one more time, buddy? Y'all mind coming out? Listen, I, I, wanna, I want you at the very bottom of your notes, there's a couple blanks. <laughs> And what I want you to do today and this week, and just keep me, I believe that the devil comes at us with very specific lies based on what season we're in. And if you're walking through a tough relationship situation, or maybe when you're, if you've got kids, when they're young, you'll hear certain lies when they get older. Or, I don't know what you're lying, but I'm, I want to ask you as specific as you can. You write down, here's the lie The devil is throwing at me in this season of my life. This is the lie that he screams every day. 
And then I want you to dig deep into God's word and you find out what the truth is. If you can't find a scripture that speaks to that, you ask for help. We will gladly dig into the word for you. And you just say, I, here's what I'm hearing, but here's what the word of God says. And then I want you to get people around you and get people around you. Say, pray this for me. Believe this for me. Fight with me. Hold my hands up when they're weak. And if you don't know what to pray, you can never go wrong praying his word. Never go wrong praying his word. You know you're praying truth when you pray straight from his word. And so when you think you've gone too far and you've messed up too much, you just proclaim God. He who knew no sin became sin so that I could become the righteousness of God. And that all who are in Christ, you're a new creation. So God, I believe in you. I'm a new creation. God, I believe your word says that your grace is sufficient for me. It's enough for me. God, your word says that here's how you prove your love for me. That while I was still a sinner, you died for me. So when I feel like you're disappointed in me, when I feel like you don't love me, you proved it. You died for me when I was at my worst. God, your love is sufficient for me. Some of you might not even know. You don't even know if he'll receive you, welcome you, or forgive you. His word says that all who call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. His grace is sufficient for you. Can we just declare that right now? Maybe you've been, you've been, you've been apart from God. Let's declare that right now. Let's stop believing that lie. Let's just, let's just say it out loud as a church. Just say, Jesus, your grace is enough for me. When I was sinning, you proved your love by dying for me. Thank you. I say yes to you. Forgive me. Wash me clean. Make me a new creation. Fill my life with your love, your mercy, your grace. I live for you. Now, let's say to our soul, now soul, you've been lying to me. You've been, oh, soul, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Can we just, let's declare it as a church this morning. Daniel, lead us in this song. Come on, church. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Come on, believe it, church. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. He's calling you home to there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Come on, sing it. Sing it. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down.
think about what that lie is. What, what's the lie that the devil's been throwing at you right now? This season of your life, what is it? Is it about your value? Is it about God himself? Is it a lie about sin in your life that it's not a big deal? Or maybe it's too big a deal. God can't reach you. God can't love you. God can't forgive you. Is it a lie about your family? A lie about your future? Right now we come against, we take those thoughts captive. We replace them with the truth. We demolish those strongholds in our lives. And we elevate the name of Jesus. We say every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. God, you will have the final word. Father, I pray for the families in our church today. The lies, we come against the lies. We speak against death. We speak against destruction. We speak against brokenness, God. We elevate, we elevate your truth. We pray for the ministry of reconciliation today. We pray for hope where there is hopelessness. We pray for life where there is death, God. We come against those lies. The devil's been telling you you're worthless, unlovable, piece of trash, no future. I say you are a masterpiece of the living God, created to make a difference for all of eternity. 